Thank you, everyone. Okay. Well, good morning. And um, well, in line with this year's theme, which is raising a generation of arrows, our senior pastor has uh, applied it by arrowing me to share to this message. <laughs> okay. So it is with great pleasure that I bring you God's word today. All right. And you know, it's also a time for you to exercise grace and forgiveness. So, so though the main topic is raising Christ-centered children, the subtopic is grace and forgiveness, if I make any mistakes. Okay. Well, so um, yeah, in line with the uh, focus for this year, which is on the children's ministry, I thought it would be appropriate on this day to share with us on this topic, raising Christ-centered children. Now, if we look at this topic from a societal or a cultural point of view, then, you know, it's quite a difficult topic to talk about because all of us have different um, preferences when it comes to raising children and our parenting styles are also very different, right? Some of us are more relaxed, some are more, you know, uh, anxious, some are what helicopter parents, tiger parents and so on. So the list just goes on. But today, we are not concerned about the parenting styles, all right? But I would I like to uh, examine this topic from the biblical perspective. So let's see what the Bible has to uh, teach us about bringing up children. And I believe that the Word of God is applicable to all parenting styles and all um, pre preferences. Now, perhaps some of us may wonder, um, how relevant are the Bible principles in today's context, since the Bible was written so many years ago and in a different historical time uh, line, right? Well, J.I. Packer, in the book, Knowing God, uh, a book which some of our young adults are using in their discipleship journey, he listed six attributes of God that would help us, or uh, help to remind us of the nature and character of God. So, um, God's love, God's life does not change. God's character does not change. God's truth does not change. God's ways do not change. God's purposes do not change. And God's son does not change. If you want to understand more, ask our young adults to elaborate, okay? So, all right. So here, it says, since God does not change, then trusting in his word and living by faith and embracing his principles should also remain the same, whether it was written in the Old Testament or the New Testament times. So, while the historical context and practices have changed since the biblical times, the attributes of God, hence his principles, remain unchanged and undoubtedly relevant. Now, um, this topic is relevant not only to parents or to mothers, but I believe it is necessary and important for the body of Christ to understand the principles of bringing up children from a biblical perspective so that together we can support our families and children through our programs and also through the way we interact with our children. All right, so what does the Bible teach us about the roles of parents? Well, in the Old Testament, Parents were told to be responsible for the spiritual development of their children. So in this regard, in the Israelite families, the home was the center of religious teaching and education. And it was the father's responsibility to ensure that this took place. I know this is Mother's Day, but all right, but it's the father's responsibility. I mean, bringing up children is um, our parents' responsibility, not just the mother's, right? So in the Old Testament days, um, education served two purposes. Firstly, it was focused on communicating God's covenant. Secondly, it was intended to instruct children on how to live a good and ethical life. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 to 7, we read, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road, when you are going to bed, when you're getting up. So parents are instructed not only to obey the laws of God, 
but also to impress them on their children and to talk about them whenever they could, wherever they went. So parents, you are given the green light to be naggy, okay? But only thing is that you must nag about God's love and God's covenant, all right? And further down in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20 to 23, in the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. And, for, and in another passage, Exodus chapter 12, verse 26, 27, to 27a, and when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them. You see, so again and again in all these verses uh, that we have just read, it tells us that parents, we have to be prepared to teach our children accurately about God's provision and faithfulness and the blessings that He will give as a result of our obedience. In fact, Throughout the Bible, parents are required to teach their children. So in, the, um, in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, one of the most referred to passages when we talk about bringing up children, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he grows old, he will not abandon it. Now, I see the word um, train here connotes more than just um, teaching or imparting knowledge. Very often, um, it carries with it the idea that you are training to achieve a certain purpose, to achieve a certain outcome, right? I mean, that's why uh, most of the sports men and women, when they go for training, it is not just so that they can, uh, you know, meet the mark, but they want to achieve the, um, the, their best, right? To achieve a certain goal, all right? So, um, likewise, it means here that when we train the child, we have to train our children so well that they have the confidence that the training will guide them in their decision-making and life choices all the days of their life. All right? So besides um, nurturing children spiritually, the Bible also instructs parents to play the disciplinary role. The book of Proverbs spells this out very clearly and explicitly. And parents are told to discipline and correct their children. For example, in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 34, if you refuse to discipline your son, it proves you don't love him. For if you love him, you will be prompt to punish him. Then Proverbs 19, verse 18, discipline your son in his early years while there is hope. If you don't, you will ruin his life. Proverbs 22, 15. A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it far away. Now, you see, of course, God is not telling us that we, must, uh, we should abuse our children. And parents, today, when you go home, don't take out the cane and start caning your children and say, oh, the preacher says so. No, that's not what it means here, okay? Now, so when we discipline our children, we have to meet it up with consistency and with affections. Discipline must be seen in the context of the overall teaching about the family and parents instilling spiritual disciplines in their children. Now, one um, infamous example in the Bible is King David. King David, although he was a very successful king and perhaps one of the most uh, successful kings in Israel, he is definitely not a very great parent, all right, when it comes to handling his children. Uh, in fact, his sons were known for their many troubles, okay? If you look at 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5 to 6, okay, it says, About that time, David's son, Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, began boasting, I will make myself king. So he provided himself with chariots and charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. Now, his father, okay, see this? His father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, even by asking, why are you doing this? 
Adonijah had been born next after Absalom, and he was very handsome. Now, so here, King David's son, Adonijah, usurped the throne that was meant for Absalom. Yet, what did King David do? Nothing. Right? He did nothing about it. Um, in fact, he takes a very passive approach, not only to Adonijah, but probably to his other sons as well. So other examples are, he did nothing when Amnon his, uh, raped Dina, or when Absalom murdered Amnon in revenge. Now, so for such a great warrior like David, when it comes to handling his children, he seems quite helpless or maybe even hopeless, right? So parents, let's not follow the um, folly of King David, but instead, the wise teachings of Proverbs. Now, the Bible tells us that discipline follows a process. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 to 13. It says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. So what Paul is saying is that discipline will be painful. I mean, if it's not painful, then it's probably not discipline. We must as well call it a reward, right? So, uh, so true healing starts with pain. And secondly, discipline leads to brokenness um, leads to brokenness, as we can see in verse 12. All right, so the child has to, to be brought to a point of willful submission. And finally, in verse 13, we need to bring restoration and assurance to the child so that the child will not remain broken forever, right? So the result of this cycle will lead to righteousness and peace. Now, the most powerful um, discipline always comes from someone who genuinely cares about us. And the Lord himself models this principle of discipline. And this is what he says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father, the son he delights in. So you see, just as the Lord disciplines us because he loves us, likewise, we should also discipline our children because we love them and we do not want them to go the wrong way. And Hebrews 12.10b tells us, God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. So when God disciplines his children, he does, so, he does it so that we can go back to the wholesome life that he has designed for us. As for us parents, we discipline our children because we want our children to lead a wise and righteous life. If you read the book of Proverbs, you'll see that wisdom is the product of discipline. So if you are wondering how you, know, you can guide your child to grow in wisdom and grace, then discipline them, right? So let's be very careful and not to buy into the modern uh, ideologies and philosophies that say, you know, we should not discipline our children, we should not, you know, um, break them, we should use the soft approach, not the hard approach. Well, if you look here, it is quite contrary to what the Bible teaches us. Okay? And in fact, discipline would have achieved its purposes when the child has learned to make the right choices. So parents, it is also important to note that the one who disciplines the child or brings pain to the child should also be the one to bring restoration and love to the child. So if the father is the one who disciplines the child, don't say, hey, mom, you go and talk to your son, all right? And vice versa. So the one who brings pain, the one who disciplines, should also be the one to restore. Okay, so... Going on to the next point. Now, so besides playing the spiritual role and the disciplinary role, more, uh, one of the most important things that God wants us to do as parents is to stand in the gap 
for our children. We are told to be intercessors. So in, first, in Samuel chapter 12, verse 23a, Samuel the priest said, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. You see, Samuel understood the importance of his role as a spiritual father for the children of Israel when he said that he would pray for them. And in fact, he says failure to pray for them is a sin. And another godly example is Job. In Job chapter 1, we read that he regularly offers prayers and sacrifices for his children. And now we look at John 17, verse 6 to 8. These are the words of Jesus. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They are always yours. You gave them to me. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. This is an excerpt of Jesus' prayer for his disciples. There are two parts to this prayer. Um, firstly, he prayed for their future, for their safety, unity, and their spiritual growth. Secondly, he told God, his Father, that he had obediently taught his disciples God's word. So in many ways, the prayer of Jesus for his disciples expresses the role of parents and also how we should pray for our children. As parents, we are in the best position to pray for our parents, uh, for our children, simply because we know them best and we care for them the most. And our children today are faced with a lot of challenges and influences. Hence, it is important for us to intercede for them and pray unceasingly for them, whether they are young children or our adult children. And it's also important to note that when we pray for our children, we pray according to God's will for them. So we submit our personal desires to God for His greater glory and purpose. Right. Now, how do we know whether we are praying according to God's will? Well, test our prayers and our desires for our children against the Word of God and His truth. Okay, hence to summarize, Parents have to assume the biblical role in spiritually nurturing their children. And while the church can provide that spiritual guidance and support, ultimately it's the home environment that our children's faith will be developed. And nurturing includes discipline. Most of all, let's stand in the gap and intercede for our children. Right. As parents, we all agree that instilling the right values in a child is important because values form the foundation of how they think about things, how they make decisions, and how they treat others. And that is why we always tell our children, you must be nice, be kind, be good, be everything good, right? But Paul reminded us in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, that it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. What Paul is saying is that doing good and living a righteous life in itself is not good enough because it will not save us. It is faith, faith that will save us. So faith is what gives purpose to our values. Hence, as Christians, teaching our children the right values is not enough. What is more important is to help our children grow in faith. Of course, fundamental to that is that we also have to ensure that our children have a personal um, relationship and a personal commitment to God. And we should also not assume that they are Christians just because they attend services regularly or Sunday school regularly or that they, you know, top the memory verse challenge consistently. It is important for us as parents to lead our children to Christ. Now, so having done that, then how do we help our children to grow in faith? I'm going to suggest five ways. So first and foremost, be a role model. Be a role model of your faith. Let's look again at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 to 9. So Moses says, 
And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on doorposts of your house and on your gates. So in this passage, Moses commissions parents to first of all, love God with all their hearts and put Christ at the center of your home. And when parents have faith, then and only then can they pass on this faith to, and conviction to their children and help them to grow spiritually. And these verses also urge parents to seize every opportunity whenever they can to help their children discover who God is. In fact, studies um, in child psychology tell us that parents are the main influencers in their children's life from birth to the age of 12. In other words, the window of opportunity is quite small. And with influences from you know, all directions, like social media, their friends and peers and so forth, it is more crucial for us as parents to seize this opportunity and guide the ch our children in the ways of God. So to be a role model of your faith, we can constantly ask ourselves, how do I apply what I've learned from God's word? How do I demonstrate my relationship with God through my relationship with others? And how do I manifest the presence of God and, and the Holy Spirit in my life? You know, when your children see you living out your faith, it will help them to understand the scriptures better. Secondly, parents need to help their children see their identity in Christ. Now, in today's society, our children are bombarded with a host of identities and complex. Some of some, children, some of our children feel bad, feel lousy about themselves, feel inferior. Some of them have an inflated ego and they feel that they are self-sufficient. Now you see, the enemy, is, the enemy will seduce our children and offer them a multitude of identities. He will lie to them and rob them of their true identity. As parents, we need to protect our children from the deception of the enemy. So guide our children to see that they are created in the image of God. And our self-worth stems from this truth. When Christ redeems us, he wants to restore our true identity and renew the image of God in us. So parents, we need to present them the identity of knowing Christ and being transformed by his spirit. Otherwise, the world will offer them a wide range of alternative counterfeit identities. Thirdly, to help our children grow in faith, immerse them in a community of believers. Though parents are the primary role, I mean, play the primary role models to, of faith to their children, we cannot exclude them from the larger community of believers, which is the church. The church is a community that celebrates God's faithfulness through our worship and service. It also offers a support system among people who share the same beliefs and values. So these shared beliefs and values provide a powerful foundation for our children's spiritual growth, especially in their developmental years. So when children are immersed in such an environment, they will find their sense of belonging and security. And in turn, their faith and trust in God will grow deeper and stronger. In today's context where many of us as parents are very busy, I probably, you know, it's very tempting to want to take the weekend or the Sunday off from church and, you know, say, oh, we have to run errands, we have to bring our children for enrichment programs and we want to bond with our children and so on. And with services going online, it makes attending church physically even maybe more uh, less appealing, all right? It's so convenient nowadays to stay at home. But parents, let's not be tempted by this. Let's not fall into this. But bring your children to church and let them experience life with a community of believers. Next, 
teach them to serve. Well, maybe this may sound a little bit uh, unusual because in our society, our children don't do very much, right? I mean, other than doing homework, that's the only work they do. But other than that, not much other work, right? So as adults, why do we serve? We serve because it is a response to God's love for us. So in the same way, let's encourage our children to serve. And perhaps instead of telling them to serve in this area, that area, and so on, why not we ask them to look around them and see where the needs are and how they can meet those needs. And when we do that, we help our children to change the way they see the world around them. And in fact, in the early church, the concept of worship and service is very much connected. In Greek, the word worship is latria, and this has the same word for service. And so in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we read, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So in the early Greek text, um, it can also be translated as, this is your spiritual act of service. So service is synonymous to worship, and these two should be inseparable. Hence, for our children to be worshippers, we need to teach them to be servants. And the attitude of service definitely does not come naturally, and it has to be cultivated. As children begin to serve, they may also discover their spiritual gifts at a young age. So parents and maybe um, people in the children's ministry, let's be intentional about this. Finally, teach them to pray. Now, one of the most important and valuable things we can do for our children is to teach them to pray, right? Help them to cultivate a lifestyle of prayer. Jesus says in John 15, 7, But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. So as Christians, we pray by faith that our prayers will be heard. And faith begins by taking God at his word. Hence, let's teach our children to pray and, and to grow. Hence, to teach our children to grow in faith, we teach them to pray and pray according to God's word, which is the Bible. Now, so praying the Bible is not something new. In fact, Jesus himself often used scriptures in his prayer. For example, in his greatest moment of agony, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is taken from Psalms 22, verse 11. Now, there are a few benefits of praying the Bible. Firstly, when we pray the Bible, it helps us to remember God's promises. So sometimes we are so overwhelmed with our own problems, struggles, and all that we forget about God's character, His promises, His faithfulness, and His goodness. So praying the truths in the Bible help us to remember what God has done and what He is still capable of doing. Secondly, it helps us to pray more specifically and in line with God's will. When we pray the Bible back to God, we speak to God in His own words and His own truths. So in this way, when we pray, we would not just be saying, for example, Lord, help my, keep my children safe today. But instead, we will be more intentional and specific, like, Lord, make my children strong and courageous. Cause them to be driven by fear, uh, not to be driven by fear or dismay. And may your presence go with them wherever they go. Do you know where this is taken from? Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, right? And thirdly, when we pray the Bible, it causes us to be open to the working of the Spirit of God and leads us into an encounter with the heart of God through His Spirit. Why? Because all Scripture is God-breathed, spoken by His Spirit, right? So C.S. Lewis said that he used Bible-based prayers in his devotional life because this helps him to be focused and stay doctrinally sound. 
So let's teach our children to pray the scriptures for in this way, as Paul says, we will have the mind of Christ. So in conclusion, let's just ask ourselves, what's the vision we have for our children? And as parents, what is the vision of yourself as a parent or a caretaker of children? Are these two visions aligned? Do they point towards knowing Christ and living a Christ-centered life? Our children today are faced with information and influences from different directions. And if we do not ground them firmly in truths and do not point them to life's answers in the Bible, then they will look for these answers elsewhere, from the internet, to their friends, and so forth. Hence, parents teach your children to know God intimately and not just to know about God. Help them to establish a personal relationship with Christ and cultivate a lifestyle of prayer so that they will remain steadfast when, and strong when life's cha uh, challenges come their way. As spiritual parents or caregivers, let us commit ourselves to love God and persevere in our faith so that we can model God's truth to our children. So today, will you make a covenant to raise your children according to the principles of God's word? Let's pray. Father, we want to give thanks to you for our children and for the children that you have placed in our midst. Indeed, God, we know that each and every one of them is precious in your sight because you have engraved them on the palms of your hand and you have also called them by name in the same way that you have called Samuel by his name. So God, I pray that you will uh, help us to be good stewards of this heritage and gift that you have given to us. And as parents and grandparents or caregivers of our children, I pray, Father, that you will help us to know how to impart your word and your truths to our children so that they will hold firm to them and that they will grow strong and mighty, mighty warriors for you, Lord, and a generation of arrows that will proclaim your name. So, Father, I pray that you will make our home a place where your presence will be felt. And Father, we pray that you will also glorify yourself in our homes and in the lives of our family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.